Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we'll take a look at what caused Purple Martins to disappear from the UP landscape and the successful efforts to bring them back. And we actually got down to one pair in 2015 before we changed out all the housing here. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. While the global population is stable, Michigan Purple Martins have experienced a steep population decline since the mid-60s. I visited Ludington Park in Escanaba and talked with Joe Kaplan, a biologist with Common Coast Research and Conservation, for a first-hand look at the successful efforts to bring them back. So when you think about Purple Martins, uh, last fall my wife and I, we drove from Escanaba down to Menominee and uh, I think we counted like 23 old Purple Martin boxes all in various states of dilapidation. And the reason that those boxes don't have Martins in them anymore is because beginning in about the mid 90s, there was a real serious decline in the population. And beginning about 94, they started disappearing. Colonies that people had been maintaining for 20, 25 years all of a sudden just disappeared. And over about a three year period, uh, almost all the Martins I knew about in the UP uh, were gone. And this was, uh, this observation was sort of uh, borne out uh, during the first Michigan Breeding Bird Atlas uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. And the second Breeding Bird Atlas that was done in the early 2000s indicated a 95% range retraction of Purple Martin in the UP. All Purple Martins nest in boxes that are put out by people. So their habitat, their nesting habitat is a bird box. And we started seeing a decline here and looked into reasons why the species was declining and then worked hard to try to reverse it. And we actually got down to one pair in 2015 before we changed out all the housing here. And uh, since then, uh, we've gone from one pair uh, up to eight pairs last year in 2019. And then this year, things kind of broke loose and we're up to 20 pairs and we're gonna fledge 60 chicks here. Uh, we have the potential to start restoring Purple Martins in the Upper Peninsula and uh, it's been a great success in Escanaba and we hope to continue, uh, continue the upward trend. The natural history of Purple Martins Birds uh, winter, because they're 100% they're insect eaters, they migrate down to the Amazon basin where most of them spend the winter in the Amazon. And then beginning in probably late, late winter, they start to make their way back to North America. The eastern population, which includes uh, every, everything um, east of the Mississippi, birds arrive to Florida, Texas, uh, probably February, March, and then arrival up here sort of at the north end of the range typically we'll start seeing the first martins late april early may and those first birds inspect their housing and then they just wait for the the rest of the colony to arrive and then typically what happens is birds will pair up again the males and females are really easy to tell apart as adults the males are uh are totally purple and blue and it takes them two years 
to get that plumage. Otherwise, they look a lot like the females, and the females are sort of bluish or dark above and light below. And as they start to set up for the season, they'll take over their the nest boxes uh, in, in the, the colonial nesters. So in the, the model that we use here is called a, a T14. There's 14 different compartments on, on four houses all put together. And they're large roomy compartments that the, that the uh, the martins can go in, lay eggs. They typically have brood sizes between four and six, and they raise those chicks on a diet of insects. Uh, they eat a lot of dragonflies, fish flies, uh, moss, any kind of flying insect. As they establish the colonies, the older birds in the, the colony that have had previous experience, what they do is they try to recruit new birds into the colony, and the way that that is done to uh, continue the, the population is the males will do a dawn song. Well, they'll go up pre-dawn and right at dawn and do a high sort of over the colony and they'll do a dawn song in the hopes of attracting new birds that were hatched the previous years from other places to recruit back into the population. It's very hard to establish a new colony without already having someone, uh, already having martins in a colony. And one way that you can establish a new colony is playing a call at dawn of, the, of a male martin, and that will alert birds that are looking for a new, new colony or suitable housing come and inspect your area, and that's how populations, uh, new populations get established. So with any luck, because this is the last population and it's up and running, producing lots of chicks, uh, we're hoping to build a network of people in the UP who want to bring back the Martins so that uh, we can establish new populations and hopefully uh, fill out that, that range uh, retraction that, uh, that has been in decline for so long. And there's no reason that uh, in 10 or 15 years we shouldn't have them back nesting in Lake Superior up at the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, over in the eastern UP. It's uh, all we need to provide for them. One of the biggest declines uh, thought to be, um, to be driving the population decline is competition with European starlings. Traditionally, we didn't have starlings here because we had long winters and it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't very good uh, environment for starlings, but with uh, less snow and more degree days, uh, we see a lot of starlings, and starlings love these, these cavities, and traditionally people would put in those two-inch holes for purple martins, and uh, if you put a two-inch hole on a box like this, you're guaranteed to get starlings, and unfortunately, starlings will start to nest earlier than martins, and what we observed here is the starlings would take over the boxes and exclude the, uh, the martins when they were arriving and it just drove the decline. So the way we did a workaround on that is uh, starlings have a big keel and martins are kind of flattened. So you'll notice uh, on all these boxes that they're laterally compressed holes. So the martins can slip right in but they're too flat uh, for the starlings. So that got rid of uh, our starling issue and unfortunately, we don't have big house sparrow populations. That's another nest competitor, another introduced species that's uh, wreaked havoc on native birds. And fortunately, we don't have a lot of house sparrows in town. Uh, the UP is still uh, inhospitable long winters for them. One of the challenges of uh, maintaining martin boxes is that, uh, you know, they're colonial nesters, they need a big like six by six cavity. It's important to have a way to raise and lower the boxes here. So all these boxes are handmade wood boxes, which I think have some great advantages over the commercial plastic and aluminum boxes. One is, you know, we don't have problems in the north with overheating in the summer, but they do down south where the martins are a lot more uh, common. So a lot of the commercial boxes uh, have a lot of ventilation, but that doesn't work up here. If you get a Martin coming in on April 28th, uh, we can get some pretty wicked weather in May. So, you know, imagine trying to survive after you've 
just gotten back from the Amazon basins by spending four or five days in an aluminum box when there's six inches of snow on the ground. So I think these have a much better advantage. Um, but as a result, since they're all wood boxes, uh, you got to have a safe way to raise and lower them to maintain them and check them. We worked with the local manufacturer, Northern Machine, to make a pulley system. And then we had all our boxes donated by a local conservation group, Wildlife Unlimited of Delta County, which has done tremendous work over the last 30 years, uh, all in Delta County. We have these uh, entrance holes that are modified to exclude starlings. And actually, this is the first year that the Martins in Ludington Park have uh, expanded. We're checking this for the first time. It looks like there's a couple pairs that have split off from the main colony and uh, starting, starting a new little sub-colony here. The first thing I can show you is this is a house sparrow nest. So this one was used earlier in the season. I was a bad landlord for not keeping these things out, but geez, it appears that the young died right in the nest. House sparrows like to fill up these boxes with a lot of debris. So this is a species that ideally you would exclude from using your martin boxes or any nest boxes for that matter. Nobody in there. This looks like an old tree swallow nest. Tree swallows like to uh, add a lot of feathers to their nests. Martins are quite different. They'll usually just put in um, a few sticks and then they like to line the nest with uh, fresh green leaves. Oh, bingo. There we go. We've got babies right there. The purple martin bird. So these birds, when they leave here, they'll be with the parents for a while and then they'll migrate and they will spend the winter down in the Amazon basin before returning back to the UP to, to seek out new territory. Now some of them might come back into these colonies or some might disperse further looking for available houses. Oh yeah, look at this little guy. So that's the best insect eater that money can't buy. And because of the association between humans and purple martins, I mean these are confiding birds. They're really used to human beings and like I said, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, you hear stories of people would go up to the lake house or the cottage or the camp and uh, put out the dock, put up the purple martin box, and then crack a beer. So we want to bring that triathlon back because we still have the docks and beer, but we don't have enough martins. I would say this bird's probably 10 to 14 days old. Yeah, and that's something that this bird, if, if it survives, is going to end up in the Amazon basin. Yeah, they're just sweet little birds. And then what we do after they're gone is we'll clean out these nest boxes to get rid of the parasites. If you leave the nesting material in over winter, when you come back in the spring, the thing will be filled with fleas. Adult fleas will overwinter in these boxes in that nesting material. It could be 30 below and those fleas don't care. So we'll clean them all out and then we'll put in a, a layer of pine needles and that's all they need to do to get started. This is not a very elaborate nest. A lot of them We'll, they'll build it up a little bit and then add like the layer of green leaves. But these birds have been in there long enough that uh, all those leaves have probably been taken out. So these chicks probably have another, you know, week to 10 days before they fledge. Looks like their uh, pin feathers are starting to come in. So as their feathers grow, feathers are attached to a blood supply and then they, they grow out from the base. And then eventually when they're fully grown, the, the um, the base of that quill get cut off from the blood supply and then that feather is just dried keratin. As these chicks get bigger, it appears that, you know, like the adults will use empty cavities so you can't have the whole family packed in there at once. But I mean, these birds, you know, they have very short legs. They spend almost 100% of their time on the wing or perching out in a conspicuous area on top of the house. You know, this is not a bird that you would find on the ground. Five, that's a nice brood. The most I've seen is six, but five is, five is, uh, is pretty typical. And this bad landlord in here, I'm not gonna reach into this one. So this is what happens when you don't maintain your martin boxes. You had a house sparrow move in, and now you got a paper wasp. This is why you can't just put up a box and walk away. You gotta maintain these things. You gotta clean out the boxes, otherwise, you know, they're just gonna be taken over by things, and this will never be used for purple martins. Oh, and this is a good example here of the cavity. 
So when we originally did it, we had the two inch holes and we just filled up with starlings. We had to modify all these to add this starlet resistant entry hole. But they don't spend a lot of time uh, nest building because this is the nest right here. Cool. <laughs> I can almost promise by this time next year, you know, it'll probably be four or five pairs. Well, that's cool. So that's an after second year male. And yeah, see, he's got some blotchy, that's probably a young male. And then that's an older male down below. So it takes two years to get that adult plumage, that purple plumage. So this bird would have been, uh, is at least in its second year. It takes two years. So. This year's chick, if it's a male, if it recruits back into a population, will look like a female next year. And then the year after that, when it returns in the spring, it'll be all purple. So this is a young bird that's not nesting, but he's, he's now recruited back into this colony. So there's 14, there's 14 places for nesting uh, in, this, in this box. There's two boxes with four holes and then two with three holes. So he'll return next year. If he returns, he'll be all purple too. And then he'll attract a mate and then they'll start, they'll start filling out this colony. Purple Martin houses are more like bird apartments and hopefully we begin to see more and more of them across the UP. If you're interested in the more typical style one room accommodations, here's some ideas from Joe for something you can easily build yourself. Yeah, so this is a design that was developed by a guy named Steve Gilbertson in Minnesota. And he was just, uh, he set out to build a better better birdhouse and he came up with a really simple PVC des design so this is a PVC tube that's just cut to length drilled an entrance hole into it put a couple vent holes and then painted it like a uh, white birch and then it has a plug in the bottom and the second piece is just a piece of cedar with a piece of two by two and then two set screws so this will attract tree swallows uh, bluebirds and chickadees. And the key for bluebirds and tree swallows, especially if you live near water, tree swallows are some of the earliest cavity nesters that, that return. So if you get a uh, tree swallow, uh, even at the farm, if you put another box within 15 feet of that tree swallow, they're very territorial against each other, but they could care less about a bluebird. Um, and then the other great feature of this is you have a piece of rebar and then an electrical conduit that you can then tap into the ground. And the great thing about this is that you can be out in the open and it, it, it don't have trouble with predators on this because raccoons can't get up it. Snakes don't seem to uh, be attracted to it. You can bring it down, inspect it, or clean it out. It's very important to clean out the nests after the young leave. Uh, it helps reduce parasites. And it's great if you have little kids you want to show baby birds to, you can take this right off. With tree swallows and bluebirds, I've gone and done nest checks where the female just stays right on the eggs. Uh, that's not the case with black capped chickadee. Chickadees are very trusting, and they're, uh, but when they're nesting, they're really secretive, and you can cause nest abandonment. So if you have chickadees that are looking to nest in one of your nest boxes, best thing to do is just uh, pretend they're not there and watch from a distance. Here's a more traditional nest box. This is designed by a friend of mine, Tom Comfort, down in Bel Air, Michigan. And uh, boy, this is like a high-tech bird box. So the features of this is this is made with LP Smart Side, so it's a lot lighter. And the great thing about this is it has a flexible hinge on the bottom so that it's really easy to check and maintain and clean out. And then there's just a little nail that goes in the side. Now, bluebirds tend to like a really open hole. Uh, so they like the open hole, but it's important to put this little bar across so that starlings don't take it over. When you're trying to get native birds nesting, you gotta be real mindful of uh, excluding house sparrows and European starlings. Because if you produce those, they'll outcompete all the native birds for these, these nest boxes. 
We're lucky in the UP, we have very low population levels of house sparrows. So I, I have these in town in Escanaba, and I've had bluebirds, chickadees, tree swallows all in my yard on an annual basis. I don't have any issues with house sparrows. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.